I don't want to make this harder for people. I want to make it easier for people. And as I've tried to say more and more in my social media outlets, look, if you're thriving, don't change anything. If you're eating olive oil and you're crushing life and you're lean and you're where you want to be, then maybe it's not affecting you negatively. On this week's podcast, I had the pleasure of talking to my friend Brad Marshall. Brad is a biologist by training, and he has some really interesting evolutionary biology ideas about hibernation and torpor as equivalents of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance in humans. We'll get into what sort of things you are doing in your diet, you've probably done it in the last week, that are signaling to your body that winter is coming, and this may lead to fat retention, increased appetite, difficulty losing weight, torpor, essentially metabolic syndrome in humans, from things that you think you are doing that are healthy. This is an interesting podcast. It gets a little technical, and it's definitely going to ruffle some feathers, but there's a lot of science to back up all of these hypotheses. Ultimately, we're just all trying to understand how humans can most easily live really radically healthy lives. So enjoy this podcast with my friend, Brad Marshall. Brad Marshall, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's exciting. It is exciting. Talk some it's, torpor. Talk torpor. Yeah, we're going to talk hibernation and torpor and weight loss. How, how is your, let's start with your weight loss journey. How is your weight loss going? Because we did a podcast a few years ago in Austin and um, we've been talking a lot recently about all kinds of things, about how olive oil might not be the best thing in the world. We're going to talk about that in this podcast. We're going to talk about linoleic acid. We're going to talk about hibernation and torpor, talk about the Inuit, all kinds of cool things. But one of the things you've been working on recently is your weight loss. You've kind of struggled with weight for a while, right? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, going right, going all the way back, I remember being, uh, I, I remember being in first grade and like going to, um, you know, you go to get your physical done, right. And you all have to take your shirts off. And I remember I had, you know, this obvious belly fat that the other kids didn't have. And I was, you know, kind of embarrassed by it. So it's something that I've struggled with, you know, literally my whole life. Um, most of the people in my family are obese. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's, it's a long-term thing. Right. And, and, um, and so I've tried some, a lot of things that work in the short term and I've done, you know, I was a wrestler in high school. So I did the, like, every year I had to lose 30 pounds, uh, at the start of the season to get down to my weight class. Right. Um, and so it was, you know, I, I literally did the kind of like, basically I starved myself, uh, every year of high school to, to suck that 30 pounds off. And I'm sure that has untold long-term damage on my metabolism. Um, uh, you know, this is a classic thing among wrestlers. Right. And then, um, sure. And then as an adult, I've done any number of different, uh, ketogenic diets over the years. Right. And, and also, uh, different low fat diets before that. And so, you know, I've had this kind of long-term journey of, of this being a very real problem. And, and I've tried, you know, a lot of different approaches. And what, one of the things is, is the more that I research, you know, I, I feel like there. I, I don't want to say, uh, I want to say this the right way. I feel like if you hit the right, if we can figure out the right combination of things that work for different people, and I do think different approaches will work differently in different people, but, um, you know, there should be a, some combinations of things that we can find where weight loss is, I, I don't want to say easy, but I want to say it's straightforward. You know, the, the more understanding that we have of the biological problem, you know, processes happening behind the scenes, um, I think we can develop better techniques that will work for a, a kind of broader swath of people. Um, you know, I, I've had success with keto in the past, um, less so as I've gotten older. And, um, and, and I also think there's, I think we need more approaches than just keto, right? Um, keto works for some people, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are never going to do keto and, we need to have, we need to have better options. And I think we need to understand, right. What more what's happening. And so, um, I just did, I've done this new diet. I'm calling it the emergence diet, but, um, the, uh, one of the things I'm doing is I'm restricting, uh, proteins and branched chain amino acids. And that means I've been restricting muscle meats and I've been replacing it with glycine rich meats. Uh, what I mean is collagen, uh, gelatin, things like that. I've been doing a lot of broth. Um, and, and that is all, Right. And, and that's been really effective. Um, and I just, right. I want to say this very early in the show. Uh, I, I'm not saying that branched chain amino acids are bad. I want to be very clear about that. What I'm saying is that 
in certain people, your metabolism has changed in, in a way that you struggle to uh, break down those branched chain amino acids and that they end up contributing to your insulin resistance. Um, and they seem to be counter, this very interestingly, they seem to be sort of counter regulated with glycine. And glycine can actually help you to uh, get out of that insulin resistance. So it kind of counters some of the effects of, of your inability to break down the branched chain amino acids. Again, I don't want to throw the branched chain amino acids under the bus. The, the, the BCAAs themselves are fine. And if you, um, if you can efficiently burn uh, branched chain amino acids, they're actually very thermogenic. So in certain people um, doing a lot of BCAAs, um, you know, things like whey protein can be very effective. Uh, but, but it's all, it's sort of, it, it dependent is, it's very dependent on your physiology. And, and I believe that this is all wrapped in with, uh, torpor because, um, you know, just to put the broad argument out there, you know, I've been arguing that the, an analogy for human obesity and human metabolic syndrome is this idea of mammalian torpor. And so, uh, mammals have a warm blood of metabolism, as everybody knows, uh, they also have the ability to sort of turn off their hot blooded metabolism and, you know, famously hibernating animals do this, but there's also a lot of other examples of ways that mammals can more kind of subtly, um, I've been using the phrase metabolic plasticity, but can kind of turn up or turn down their metabolic rate a little bit, depending on environmental factors. Um, and there's a great John Speakman paper uh, that came out, I think, just this year, uh, earlier in the year. And, and he showed that human metabolic rates have absolutely declined over the last 100 years. And there's more data over the last 30 years. But, but even going back 100 years, you can see the decline in uh, metabolic rate. And that is paralleled by a decline in human body temperature. Um, and we have records from 100 years ago showing that people really used to be 98.6. And now when most people measure their body temperature, you know, it's 97 and a half or, uh, 97.9 maybe. Um, and so, right. And so, um, to bring that back to the BCAA thing, um, mammals who are hibernating, uh, go to great lengths to preserve their lean mass, to preserve muscle mass and to prevent the breakdown of the muscle mass. And so that, and of course, mammals who are fattening for winter, they want to be kind of insulin resistant because that helps them, you know, convert the, the, the carbohydrates, but also the proteins in their diet, um, and convert that into fat and, and it helps them fatten up for winter. Um, and so, and so when I look at it, this is all, you know, these things all kind of come together. Um, it, it, this idea of torpor and, um, inability to break down, you know, amino acids and insulin resistance, um, and of course it, it, you know, biology is complicated, right. And the different fats that you eat have a role in sort of triggering this, but then once it's triggered, then the amino acids come in. Um, and so, you know, it's a big puzzle and we're trying to figure it out, but I do think we're getting closer. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. This is a concept that, that I think, I think you're onto something here. The idea that insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction, obesity is some sort of human equivalent of pre-hibernation. And in, in mammals, you, you know this as a, a biologist, uh, the word torpor is used. Torpor is a pre-hibernation state, right? It's like an intermediate hibernation, like an in-between in hibernation state. Yeah, the, there's this subtle differentiation between the words where where hibernation is sort of the 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 long period where you're um you know uh you 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 lower your metabolic rate for like these two week blocks and then and then they rewarm themselves for a couple of days and then they go back into this hibernation but torpor is just the idea of essentially turning down your metabolism and so there are animals who will go into this torpor for like, uh, like just a few hours sometimes. Um, and, and this is seen pretty widely in the, uh, birds do this too, actually. Uh, but, but that like a mouse in the lab, if you give them, um, uh, 
if you give them a, something that activates a nuclear receptor called PPA or alpha, they'll start having these torpor bouts that last like eight hours long. Um, so instead of sleeping, they just completely shut down and, you know, their body temperature will drop to like, you know, 40 degrees or something like very, very, very cold. Right. Uh, which is very different than when, you, of course, when you go to sleep, your metabolic rate drops a little bit. Um, when you go into torpor, your metabolic rate drops, you know, to almost zero, right? It goes down to 15% of what it was or something. And so torpor is really this idea that you've essentially turned your metabolism off or let's say down by, you know, 80% plus, right? You've, you've somehow shut off your metabolism. Yeah. And I don't think we see humans with 80% declines in their metabolism, but we definitely see something happening in humans where by and large, like you said, John Speakman's paper on body temperature decline in the last 100 years, our metabolism as a population is going down. And there are lots of reasons this could be happening. There are lots of hypotheses we'll talk about in this podcast about why we think that's happening. And it's like you have that little nest thing on your thermostat on your wall. You're turning your body metabolism down a little bit. And it makes so much sense when I think about it this way that there are evolutionary signals in our environment that we would have experienced, that all mammals experience, depending on where they are on the globe and what season it is, that may lead to decline in metabolic rates and increase body fat, decrease leanness to prepare us for winter. So this idea that in this podcast, we'll talk a lot about fatty acids as signals of changes in body composition to get us ready for winter, historically, evolutionarily, kind of this mammalian lineage. And as humans, we don't hibernate, but we probably have conserved mechanisms that somewhat look like hibernating mammals. And that's really interesting because it starts to make sense that, okay, if we start doing things in terms of our diet that are not evolutionarily appropriate or consistent with what we would have done, or that mimic what we would have been exposed to at different regions of the globe where right. certain things are not, are not available, saturated fats versus polyunsaturated fats, then we start to look like humans preparing for hibernation or humans preparing for winter or humans packing on fat mass as we are prepared for a time of scarcity. So let's talk about some of those signals. I want to come back to your weight loss journey. Thanks for sharing that. It's kind of personal oh, yeah. stuff, but I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I think that Genetics play a role here. There is individuality. I don't think ketogenic diets work for a lot of people. They might work for some people. I definitely think there's probably individual genetics around what's happened with you and why it's a little harder for you to lose weight than other people. But these signals in our environment are fascinating because I just don't think that there's enough attention given to this idea. There is this idea that I've pushed back against repeatedly, calories in, calories out, which works at a thermodynamic level. But what if the foods you put in on the calories inside are signals to your body and affect your metabolism in ways that affect the calories out? That's not really being talked about, I don't think, enough. So let's, I 100% let's, agree. <laughs> yeah, let's start with that. I mean, let's just start with, like, just go for the jugular, Brad. Let's talk about olive oil um, because this is fascinating. Yeah. So how does olive oil, how, what's your idea? How does olive oil actually make us fat? And why would this happen evolutionarily? major health improvements. Check out this review on grass-fed colostrum from Heart and Soil Supplements. I lived in a moldy house which destroyed my health, specifically my digestion, and was allergic to almost everything. After two years, I made moderate improvement, but still had a constantly gurgling stomach, strong allergic reaction to some things. I tried so many Ayurvedic supplements and various diets, but to no great avail. Then after one month of a meat and fruit diet, along with grass-fed colostrum from Heart and Soil Supplements, I feel back to normal no more allergies. Pretty amazing. I largely credit that to the organ supplements and the colostrum from Heart and Soil. Thanks for your work. Guys, colostrum is incredibly valuable. There's so much research on this first milk from cows, immunoglobulins, bioactive proteins, incredible stuff on colostrum. Even at doses as low as 1.5 grams, our colostrum is a dose of three grams. It is all from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand, the finest on the planet, except no substitutes. If you are struggling with gut issues, any of these things that may affect your energy, muscle recovery, especially the gut issue thing though, check out grass-fed colostrum from Heart and Soil Supplements. You can find us at heartandsoil.com.
animalbase30.co. Also, happy Animal Base 30. In case you missed it, Animal Base 30 started January the 1st. It's a free 30-day animal-based eating challenge with heart and soil. There's an animal-based guide. There is a community. There's discounts on heart and soil supplements. If you buy any of our supplements and sign up for Animal Base 30, you get a free bottle of Firestarter. We talk a lot about Firestarter in this episode with stearic acid. So go to animalbase30.com, sign up. We'll see you guys in Animal Base 30. It's not too late to sign up. Join over 30,000 people who are doing this challenge in January and improving their health starting off the year right in 2024. Right. And so let's, so the, the last video, so, you know, I do YouTube videos on fire in a bottle YouTube. And, and the last video I wrote about Echid or I talked about echidnas and, um, echidna is a, um, is, is the spiny anteater. They live in Australia and they're essentially, uh, they're similar to platypuses. They're closely related to platypuses. They're mammals who still lay eggs and, uh, they don't have nipples. They they uh, they have mammary glands. They produce milk, but like they're so old, uh, you know, they they come they evolved during the Triassic, and, and so these are like the oldest mammals, the oldest branch of the mammalian family tree that kind of still exists, right? And when you look at those, um, and and they hibernate, they hibernate, right? And they eat mostly ants, uh, as the name would suggest, and so. They're eating ants that are very high in monounsaturated fats, you know, similar to olive oil. And so, uh, and when you look at them, as they approach the, the hibernation season, they're very high. Um, if you look at their fat composition, they're full of these monounsaturated fats. They're full of, uh, of oleic acid, but also palmitoleic acid peaks right before hibernation. Then they hibernate, they burn off a lot of fat, and over the winter, um, the amount of saturated fat that they has increases as a percentage, the amount of monounsaturated fat goes down. Um, and they come out of, and when they come out of hibernation, they're a lot more saturated. Now, one of the reasons that's interesting is that if you look at, and I talk about this in the same video, if you look at ants at the equator, um, there was this paper in out of Brazil and they looked at like 30 different tropical ant species. And those ants are very high in stearic acid. They have a ratio of, some of them have more stearic acid than they had of oleic acid, which is very rare. And certainly in foods grown far from the equator, you almost never find that. Oleic acid is the, the main fat in so many of the different, like any animal fats. Um, but these Brazilian ants, and like I say, 30 different species of ant, it's not like they found this one species. They looked at every ant they could find in Brazil and they all have this very high ratio of saturated fat to monounsaturated fat. And, and ants don't have a lot of polyunsaturated fat. And then they looked in Germany and they looked at maybe seven different ant species in Germany. I don't think there are as many species of ant in Germany as there are in Brazil. Um, and all of those German ants had about 20 times or more as much oleic acid as they had of stearic acid. Um, and so as you move, uh, farther from the equator, higher in latitude, whether you go north or south, um, what happens is the ratio of stearic acid to oleic acid changes in the food that the first mammals would have eaten. And so mammal, the earliest mammals uh, mostly ate insects. They were small mammals and they ate a lot of things like ants. Um, and so when you move from the equator, you're, you know, and, and this is sort of parallel, right? In the, in the plant kingdom, because you think about cocoa butter, right? Cocoa butter is a tropical plant very saturated, lots of stearic acid. And then, you know, olive oil is grown more in the North and that has a lot of oleic acid and not much stearic acid, just like the ants, right? And, and this is of course, um, partially due to weather reasons. Um, when it's cold, obviously saturated fat gets very hard and it's probably hard for a, um, you know, if an olive had the same fat composition as a cocoa bean, it would be hard to kind of mobilize those fats and for the olive to run its metabolism and the olive seed to grow on a cold day, you know, in a, in a, even, even somewhere like Italy, which is mostly uh, reasonably warm, but they still have cold days in the winter. And so, you know, so as you get away from the equator, you see a lot more monounsaturated fat and the saturated fat in the echidna peaks right before it goes into hibernation. And so you, you put those facts together and then there's a great series of paper 
uh, papers from James Natambi. And in the lab, what he shows is if you remove that gene, the one that converts the saturated fats to monounsaturated fats in a mouse, uh, the mice can't get fat. Um, <laughs> so, so that so these are called S, this gene is called SCD1. And so, if you take an SCD1 deficient mice or a mouse or a SCD1 knockout mice mouse, they they have super high metabolic rates. Their metabolic rates are like forty percent higher than um, than a normal mouse. Uh, and it's only because they can't make monounsaturated fat. And so then also in that same John Speakman paper that we already mentioned, he showed that um, in mice, they, they fed them all these different oils at like 40% of calories. And he showed that the ones fed the most saturated fat had the highest metabolic rates. And as they fed them more and more and more unsaturated fats, the metabolic rates in these mice just drop. Um, and the Tambi has a whole series of papers. What, one of the really interesting ones he wrote was we have uh, something called SREB-P, which is, uh, they call it the, the master lipogenic transcription factor, right? And so this is a, this is a transcription factor that, that turns on your genes involved in de novo lipogenesis, which means making fat, right? And so if you eat carbohydrate or if you eat protein, if you have upregulated lipogenic enzymes, you'll turn more of that into fat. And what Natambi found was that um, the oleic acid binds to that the master uh, lipogenic transcription factor, SREB-P, and activates it. And so the transcription factor <laughs> that controls lipogenesis is actually activated by monounsaturated fats. And, and so what you see, what, so there's a positive feedback loop there where uh, the mammal is, is, as it moves away from the equator, it's eating ants that are getting higher and higher in monounsaturated fat. And that monounsaturated fat is hitting all kinds of signals. One, it's activating PPA or alpha um, when you consume it. And PPA or alpha is a very interesting, um, that's another high level transcription factor that's kind of monitoring the fats that you eat. And it's causing your metabolism to behave accordingly. And then um, these monounsaturated fats are actually activating these pro-lipogenic uh, enzymes. And if you look in feeding studies where they take a rat or a pig and you feed them five different kinds of oil, um, you know, there's one in uh, rats that I'm sure that I've, sh I've shared with you, but there's one where they fed them beef tallow or they fed them olive oil, or they fed them, I believe it was high oleic, uh, or sorry, high linoleic sunflower oil. Um, the ones fed the olive oil had the highest expression of lipogenic enzymes in their liver by a lot. And then you see the same thing happens in pigs. And so, you know, you have like, uh, so we have on a lot of different levels, it appears that uh, oleic acid, the monounsaturated fat can be a real problem for your metabolism and your metabolic rate. Um, and just to throw one other thing out there, there's another Natambi paper where they showed that the oleic acid prevents the breakdown of circulating cannabinoids. Um, and so, and so the cannabinoids are endogenous molecules that we make that hit our cannabinoid receptors and kind of can give you the munchies, right? If you have too many of these cannabinoids and, and the, the oleic acid is preventing the breakdown of the cannabinoids. And so you see like on eight different levels, the oleic acid is part of this positive feedback loop of, you know, animals in the north kind of fattening for winter. Um, and the other thing, and just one more fact on that um, idea, the ants in Germany that have a lot more oleic acid also have a lot higher uh, body fat percentage. So as the ants move away from the equator, they have more oleic acid and they're fatter. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, you see, so you see what to me looks like this kind of overwhelming evidence that oleic acid is really part of the problem. Um, and this is of course shocking to people because we're always being told that olive oil is great. Um, and that people from Italy are lean and healthy. Um, and th there's a funny it's a funny story about that. So, uh, you know, of course, there's different ways that we have of assessing a population and 
how many people are obese. And one of the ways is you just send people like a, like a, a, a flyer in the mail and they write down their, their height and their weight and they send it back in. And then we do other studies where they take a representative population sample and you have to go into the clinic and get measured by, you know, our nurse or a healthcare professional. And interestingly, the Italians do really well in terms of obesity rates on the first kind of study where you just ask them what their weight is. But if you weigh them, you find out that that they're actually uh, significantly more obese than, for instance, the French who share, who they share a border with and where they eat butter. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I think that this is, to me, this is really interesting. It's not that monounsaturated fats are poisonous for humans. My sense of this is that the issue here is that they're a signal. Yes. And, and the ratio or the relative contributions of our diets of oleic acid, which is an 18 carbon monounsaturated fat versus stearic acid and other saturated fats. Stearic acid is an 18 carbon saturated fat. You mentioned stearic acid, just so people know stearic acid present in tallow. It's in the fire starter that we make at hardened soil. It's kind of the reason we developed that supplement, but it's an 18 carbon saturated fat. Clearly in mice leads to leanness, probably in humans leads to leanness as well. Pretty clear data there, but it seems that there's this ratio in our foods between oleic acid and stearic acid. And we'll get to linoleic acid, which is an 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fat that I've talked about with seed oils. We'll get to that as well, because they're all connected. But I don't want people to think that oleic acid is, is bad for humans. But understand this, that butter is what, Brad? 30%, 35% oleic acid, MUFA? Uh, yeah, it's, it's only like 25%, usually below okay. 30. And then tallow is maybe 47%? Something like that, yeah, approaching half. Yep. And then olive oil is what, 75%? Yeah, monounsaturated sure. fat. Yes, exactly. And, exactly. And and olive oil has and then if you look the other way, olive oil is only like 3% stearic acid, I think. And so so that ratio of of oleic acid to stearic acid in olive oil is 25 to 1. Um in butter it might be 2.5 to 1. And so you see that ratio just explode as you go from butter to olive oil. And and beef suet is a good example. Suet is specifically tallow, tallow from the kidney, um, and it's uh, suet is very high in stearic acid. And so, even though beef suet might be forty percent oleic acid, higher than butter, but it's balanced out by being you know twenty or twenty five percent stearic acid. Um, and so that seems to work pretty well. And and beef suet was the classic. Um, frying fat of the French, uh, you know, the chef or the author, Elizabeth David, who wrote several, uh, books about French cooking says, yes, the French prefer beef suet to fry in. Um, and so that's very classic. And the other thing about stearic acid and the thing that I've written about, in, uh, or made a video, a video about and talk about in the blog is that when you look at human adipose tissue, in studies from the 1960s, or, or there's even one from like 1943, uh, it showed that human adipose tissue was something like seven or eight percent stearic acid. And if you look today, um, not only in people who are obese, but the general population, everyone, whether or not you're obese today, the normal stearic acid rate is less than three and a half percent. It's like three point three percent. And it used to be more like six. And so, you know, as a as a society, uh, our stearic acid levels have dramatically dropped. Um, and I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any question about that. I, I think it's, that's unquestionable. Um, and so a lot, right. And so you see the metabolic rate drop and you see the, the parallel drop in human adipose tissue, stearic acid content. And that means that we have upregulated SCD one, which is the thing that, you know, James Natambi in mice has shown is absolutely integral to this process of obesity. And just to show one more example of exactly how, uh, like you say, as signaling molecules, so that oleic acid prevents the breakdown of the, um, of the endocannabinoids. They give you the munchies. Well, the stearic acid does the opposite. 
it increases the activity of the enzyme that break down the endocannabinoids. And so if you have more stearic acid and less oleic acid, you're going to have less circulating endocannabinoids. And the endocannabinoids themselves, they are involved in appetite regulation, but they also can directly slow down metabolic rate. And we don't really know all the ways they do it, but it's clear that they do. At the level of thyroid hormones, they do. I mean, they negatively affect thyroid hormones and there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot going on there with thyroid hormones. And interestingly, this is foreshadowing. There's evidence that linoleic acid and oleic acid both negatively affect the binding of T3 to its nuclear receptor. They both negatively affect the conversion of T4 to T3. So the conversion of thyroxine to triiodothyronine, T3 being triiodothyronine, that's the active form of thyroid hormone. And they both negatively affect the binding of thyroxine and T3 to thyroid binding globulin. So it's like at, at every level across multiple species, often including humans, uh, we've tried to be careful to say when it's a mouse study versus a pig study versus a study in bears or humans, we can clarify that more in the future. But often across multiple species, across multiple pathways, we see signaling molecules in the fats. But, but Brad, calories in, calories out, just cut your... This is what I'm talking about, right? That, that these are signaling molecules. And again, it's not that you should never eat linoleic acid. Tallow contains 1% to 2% linoleic acid. Safflower right. oil is 65% linoleic acid. There's a big difference there. It's, it's like, I don't want to say the dose makes the poison, but the dose is important here. And so the ratio, and I love that you pointed this out, these are probably evolutionarily determined ratios of stearic acid to oleic acid, so saturated 18 carbon, monounsaturated 18 carbon, to polyunsaturated 18 carbon being linoleic acid in this case, the ratios there are just evolutionary signals to humans to say, hey, somehow you wandered up into British Columbia and you need to get fat right now. And there are some nuts on these trees, or if you're eating animals, they're gonna have more polyunsaturated fat, or the animals are eating more polyunsaturated fat, or there are some egg corns over here that have more monounsaturated fat. You, you just, monounsaturated fats are more available as you move away from the equator, as are polyunsaturated fats. The problem, and this is something I want to make sure people understand this, and then we'll dive deeper, is that even though a lot of people listening to this podcast might live in places, Brad, you live in upstate New York, where there is winter, hopefully nobody listening to this podcast is going to go through a food scarcity over the winter. We, we live in this sort of discordant environment where we're giving our body signals that it should fatten out up because there's a food scarcity coming with winter, but we can all go to the grocery store and still eat food all winter. Thankfully, this is an amazing time to be alive as a human, but we're giving our body these signals. And so when I see an obese human now, it makes me think, oh, they're just giving their body the wrong signals, or they've been giving their body the wrong signals for the last 30 years. Even if it's here at the eighth north latitude in Costa Rica, where it's very warm, these foods full of these oils, giving people the wrong signal are here. Right. And so, so even at the equator, people can get obese. One of the most interesting things that I saw you point out in one of your videos was the difference in the obesity levels between Southern and Northern Italy. And then talk about obesity in Spain, because I think that when people hear this notion that monounsaturated fat, rich olive oil, and we'll talk about something good in olive oil in a moment, potentially. Yeah. The notion that monounsaturated fat olive oil is bad for humans, they think, and you've mentioned this in one of your videos, there are comments that say, well, then how do you square this with all of these regions of the world where people eat this olive oil, they're so healthy. But you pointed out in your video that like, there's a real difference in the Southern region of Italy versus the Northern region of Italy and then Spain. Yeah. And so, right. So if you look at the, if you actually look uh, in a completely unbiased way at the the data that we have, right, the, the studies that we have about these Mediterranean countries, what you see is that um, Spain has one of the highest rates of diabetes in the world. I mean, they are rivaling the U.S. In, in diabetes rates. And everything that I, all the evidence that I have suggests that Spanish people really do mainly eat olive oil, right? And they're just as diabetic as the U.S. is. And then... Um, Italy, there's a very clear difference. In the northern Italy, 
is the Po Valley. That's where polenta comes from. And they mostly eat butter there. They eat butter and they eat cornmeal. And it, as you go to the south, um, the diet becomes more wheat and olive oil. And the, the obesity is concentrated in the rural south of, of Italy. And some of the areas in, rural, or in southern Italy, according to that study, were like 40% obesity rates, which again rivals, um, rivals the U.S., right? And um, childhood obesity is now a real problem in Greece. Um, and Italy has one of the highest rates of fatty liver disease on, on earth. Um, in fact, Italy, they think will soon become the, the number one country in terms of the percentage of people who have fatty liver disease. And so, you know, uh, that's, I think the story that we're being told about this incredible health of the Mediterranean region might just simply be incorrect. Um, you know, people go to Rome, right. And Rome's a very international destination and, and, you know, th there is this bias, right, where the the probably the healthiest, happiest people are the ones traveling around the world and showing up in Rome and people go to Rome and go, oh, yeah, Italy's great. Everyone's super healthy. But if you go into the countryside where they uh, eat olive oil, you, I think you'll find a different story. Now. A lot of people would also push back on this olive oil perspective, citing the PREDIMED trial and. You've got a great video on your webs on YouTube about PREDIMED. So let's dig into this a little bit. This will get a little technical, but I know um, my friend, Stephen Gundry, who I haven't talked to in a while, but he's a huge advocate for olive oil. And yeah. he's, he said the point of, of vegetables and salads is just to get more olive oil in your mouth. Um, I couldn't disagree more in, in any sense. Not in terms, I don't think there's any point in eating vegetables and definitely don't use the vegetables as a vehicle for olive oil. But then right. he says, PREDIMED, this is a quote from Stephen Gundry, uh, as you point out in your video on this, PREDIMED is the best study showing that olive oil is healthy for humans. So let's, let's talk about the PREDIMED trial for a minute, because I've heard other people say the same thing, Brad. I recently was reading Peter Atia's book, and not only does Peter Atia, and this is no, no shade on Peter Atia, other than just, I'm just pointing out his perspectives, not only does Peter Atia not believe that seed oils are harmful for humans based on his interpretation of the literature. He also points to PREDIMED saying that monounsaturated fats are healthy for humans. And I think that there's a lot of oversight here on both counts. Yeah. And so the, Pred the PREDIMED trial is a funny trial. It's so it's done in Spain. Um, and what happened is what they did was they told people to, um, they gave people this extra virgin olive oil and the thing is, the people on the PREDIMED trial were mostly diabetic, um, or at least they had to have several uh, parts of the metabolic syndrome. They were older, and they all, when they um, surveyed them at the beginning, they were all already eating a Mediterranean diet. And so they're in Spain, and they're, they're finding these thousands of people who have been eating olive oil their whole lives. Now they're diabetic. And it was those people that they selected and what they did was they gave them olive oil, which they were all already eating. So they, so what they did was they substituted kind of lower grade olive oil for uh, extra virgin olive oil, which is higher in polyphenols. And so they did, they were, and they were encouraged to eat a lot of olive oil. And so they did up their olive oil a little bit, but it was like, you know, it was like a hundred grams a day to like 110 or 115. Right. And so mostly what changed is they were getting a lot more polyphenols. And there are some actually very interesting polyphenols in olive oil. Uh, one of them actually blocks the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is one of the other favorite themes of my blog um, or in my YouTube series is, is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And if you, and so that thing, the AHR, forms this kind of positive feedback loop with PPAR alpha. And that is an integral part of this whole positive feedback loop in the fattening process. And so olive oil has this compound that actually can short circuit that process, but it's almost like you're maybe eating the poison and the cure at the same time. And that works differently in different people. One of the interesting things in PREDIMED was that, you know, the people in the olive oil intervention, I think on average, they actually lost a little bit of weight, but if they switched from, this is very interesting. If they switched from um, sunflower oil, which is very high in linoleic acid to olive oil, 
they were actually significantly more likely to develop obesity over the course of the trial. And so, <laughs> you know, to what me- What was the odd um, ratio of that? And that was statistically significant. This is a secondary analysis of the PREDIMED data. We can put it on the screen on YouTube. What was the, I think the odds ratio was like 1.36 or something like- Yeah, it was, it was right. Just a, and it was statistically significant, right? So right. it's a pretty striking finding that nobody talks about. Nobody talks about it <laughs> because it's on, right? Because it's inconvenient to the dominant narrative, right? And so people want to bring it up. And, I, you know, and so, yeah, it's just, I, I think the data is overwhelming. And, and I think it's, you know, what I say is, uh, sure, if you like gambling, if you like roulette, take the olive oil because some people lost weight on it and other people's gained weight. But it's, but you really are, um, if you're doing olive oil, you really are mucking about with a lot of signaling loops, a lot of feedback loops, a lot of like, it's, you're really just letting it fly. You know, you're at the, you're at the roulette table kind of, that's, that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah. I, I think you're just giving your body the signal that winter is coming with, with olive oil. It doesn't. To be clear. So when you, um, when you eat olive oil, you release a molecule called OEA which is a signaling molecule, and it comes from the consumption of oleic acid. And OEA is a potent stimulator of PPAR alpha. And uh, if you give PPAR alpha, or if you give a, a pharmaceutical drug that activates PPAR alpha in, to mice in the lab, the mice go into torpor. Um, you can actually, by activating PPAR alpha, which is exactly what olive oil does when a human eats it, you can put a mice into torpor in the lab. And another funny thing <laughs> is that, um, so in, in several human trials, they give people um, a, a, a meal that contains carbohydrate and olive oil, and then they compare it to a meal that contains like carbohydrate and heavy cream, right? And what they find is that if you get the olive oil, uh, you burn less carbohydrates in the two hours following that meal. Um, to me, that suggests that the olive oil is making you insulin resistant. But what the authors say is because, because if you eat a mixed meal of carbohydrate and fat, the correct thing to do is to burn the carbohydrate first because you can't store the carbohydrate. And the longer it sticks around, the more likely you're going to be to do de novo lipogenesis with it. So the, the, the correct thing to do as an animal is to burn the carbohydrate first, right? And so the olive oil makes you do the opposite. And that, by the way, is exactly what obese humans do. Obese humans are not good at um, responding to a meal by turning on carbohydrate metabolism. And one way you can make your metabolism look just like that of an obese human is to uh, consume olive oil with your carbohydrates. And <laughs> it's funny because, of course, in the study, the, the scientists conclude, this is great. Olive oil helps you burn fat. Right. Because no matter which way it comes out, they're going to say the olive oil is better. Right. That's predetermined before the study starts. So if it had gone the other way, then they would have said butter makes you insulin resistant. But if it goes in this way, they say, well, olive oil helps you burn fat <laughs> but because you, know, you have to burn one or the other. Brad, what happens if you give a human a drug like rosaglitazone that stimulates PPAR alpha, PPAR alpha? Well, this, this gets very complicated. So rosaglitazone uh, actually uh, stimulates PPR gamma, which is the other, the other PPAR. And, and, and that is associated with uh, significant weight gain in humans. What if you give them phenofibrate? If you give them phenofibrate, uh, they get fatty liver. Um, and this is, and this, is, this is funny because in mice, the opposite thing happens. So, so they do these trials in mice where they give them phenofibrate and the mice will lose weight and they'll, and they'll get rid of liver fat. But uh, the thing about that is that, so PPAR alpha, the PP stands for peroxisome proliferator and mice eat a lot of seeds, right? They're seed eaters. And so we have these things called peroxisomes and you can actually break down fat either in your mitochondria or in your peroxisome. And there's some reasons why breaking them down in peroxisomes is actually a little bit better from a uh, kind of from a redox perspective. And we don't need to dig all the way into that right now. But so in these mice, if you give them uh, phenofibrate, it activates PPR alpha. They massively surge their peroxisomes 
and that helps them to burn some of the fat and that helps them to get the fat out of their liver and they lose weight. Humans don't have that same ability to surge peroxisomes like that. And so peroxisomes are an organ that we use to get rid of uh, a lot of the polyunsaturated fats. We can use it to break down a lot of the fats that we don't really like and we don't want to store. So, and, and I think this is one of the things that the system is doing, PPIR. So if you feed, um, if you feed a human or a mouse uh, alpha linolenic acid, which is the polyunsaturated fat that comes from flaxseed oil, right? We, we never accumulate that fat to a significant degree. And the reason is that it activates PPAR alpha. And when PPAR alpha sees fats coming in that it doesn't like, it, um, it upregulates breaking them down in all kinds of ways. Uh, one of those ways is by activating peroxisomes. Another way is by sending more fat into the mitochondria. Yet another way is increasing these desaturase enzymes um, like delta-6 desaturase. And those things are involved in essentially detoxification pathways. Um, delta-6 desaturase helps convert uh, linoleic acid, for instance, to arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid is another signaling molecule. But when we see these I call I just call them weird fats, right? It could be polyunsaturated fats. It can be oxidized linoleic acid. There's something called branch chain fats. And these things all have an effect on activating this PPR alpha. And the PPR alpha says, get rid of these things. And so it's sending them to peroxisomes, sending them to mitochondria, it's desaturating them. And we can actually eliminate them in the urine that way through a process called glucuronidation. And PPR alpha also controls that process. Um, and so the PBR alpha is essentially in my, the way I think about it is sort of a, the, the policeman who controls what types of fats we're going to keep and what types of fats we're going to break down and possibly rebuild into fats that we'd like more. Um, but one of the things that's, that's very striking is if humans eat, um, alpha, alpha linolenic acid, which is from flaxseed oil very quickly, you will find that the, the, the carbon structure of that alpha linolenic acid has been broken all the way down and it's been rebuilt into saturated fat. Palmitic acid is the first place that you see it because palmitic acid is the end product of, of lipogenesis. And so when a human eats ALA, the body very rapidly, like it activates PPR alpha. We increase the amount of fat that we're sending in to our mitochondria, probably past um, the amount that we need those calories, right? We don't need those calories. We're sending, we're sending that fat in to break it down because we want to get rid of the fat and then it gets rebuilt into, into saturated fat. And then ultimately it winds up as oleic acid um, because when we're doing a lot of de novo lipogenesis, the end product overwhelmingly becomes oleic acid over time. Um, and so, yeah, you see these certain fats and they come in, they're activating PPR alpha. It's saying, get rid of them. You know, some of them come out in the urine. A lot of them just get rebuilt and they go back into that process of, of DNL, de novo lipogenesis. I want to talk more about de novo lipogenesis because there's some really interesting things there. Before we get to DNL, I want to talk about DNL in one second. I just want to highlight a couple of things, more things about PREDIMED. We, we skipped a little ahead on that a little bit. So PREDIMED, this trial in Spain, it's looking at basically two groups of people, control group, who they advised to eat, well, three groups of people, control group, who they advised to eat a low fat diet and actually ended up eating a diet of 37% fat. So the control group did not eat a low fat diet like they were supposed to. There was an olive oil intervention group. They gave them a liter of olive oil per week, week and they were instructed to eat, you know, multiple tablespoons per day. And there was a third group who they gave mixed nuts. As Brad pointed out, I don't think we highlighted this enough. If you look at the actual amount of olive oil consumed between the control group and the olive oil group, the difference was something like one tablespoon per day, 15 grams per day difference between the control group and the intervention group. That's your study. Now, Brad pointed this out, but let's highlight. One of the things that was different between them was that the control group ate more refined olive oil and the intervention group ate more extra virgin olive oil. That's where this hydroxytyrosol comes in, this polyphenol that's only present in extra virgin olive oil, not in refined olive oil. And as you pointed out, Brad, if we look at mice and we look at things that are probably the equivalent of a, of a refined olive oil, like a triolan, these massively increase the lipogenic enzymes. Now, 
if you looked at, at Freddie Med, there were a lot of questions. When Freddie Med was published, it was retracted immediately, <laughs> like instantly, because of problems with randomization, and then immediately republished. So there's just there's so many shady things about it. But the, the results of Freddie Med ask us to believe that one tablespoon difference of olive oil per day led to a, what, Brad, almost a 30% reduction in mortality over the five years of the study. One tablespoon of yeah, olive oil. They're just, they're it absolute, seems kind of preposterous. They're ridiculous numbers. It, it's, there's got to be something else going on. <laughs> well, and, and to be clear, and to be clear, uh, he's, when you say one tablespoon more, we're talking like nine tablespoons versus 10 tablespoons, exactly. right? It's, it's a lot. Like they're already eating a lot. Yeah. And then as Brad pointed out, if you look at the secondary analysis of Freddie Med, it brings up a lot of questions about obesity and diabetes. There's statistically significant increases in people who are eating more olive oil and diabetes and obesity. And so if you actually say that the Freddie Med is your trial for substantiating a claim that olive oil is good for humans, you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a lot of owning up to do there. There's, right. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> trial, I, think, I think that trial raises as many questions as it answers. Yeah. And, 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 and the only thing you can really conclude is that the hydroxytyrosol seems like it, it is actually beneficial for some people. Right. And there are other ways to get polyphenols other than eating a bunch of monounsaturated fat that might do other negative things in your body or give your body a signal that winter is coming. Um, exactly. Um, de novo lipogenesis. It's a complex concept, probably too complex for this podcast, but there are, there's a, you can look at human fat. And you can look at this in the phospholipids, or you can look at it in the adipose tissue, in the cell membranes. And we can look at the composition of the fats in our bodies. And we can break it down into looking at things like palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon saturated fat, palmitic palmitic acid, which is 16 carbon monounsaturated fat, myristic acid, um, lauric acid, stearic acid. We talked about oleic acid. There's a lot of words here, guys, in terms of the fats. But there's a very specific signature of fats in animals who are in torpor or undergoing hibernation. And there's an equivalent signature of fats in humans doing de novo lipogenesis, right, Brad? Like there's, it's like exactly the same pattern that we see. Let's talk about this a little bit. Right. And so what happens is it seems like, um, and this is kind of what I was saying before, when you, when you do things that activate uh, PPR alpha and, and you're sort of increasing kind of like fat churn. And what happens is the saturated fats and the polyunsaturated fats end up, well, the, the saturated fats get, um, they get desaturated and they become monounsaturated fat and the polyunsaturated fats either get, um, either they get eliminated through, uh, you know, this, Delta, this D6D, this delta 60 saturase pathway, and we urinate them out, or they get broken down and they get rebuilt also into monounsaturated fats. And so the pattern becomes that as something fattens, and this is the same thing you see in torpor heading into hibernation, this is saturated fats drop, actually polyunsaturated fats drop, and monounsaturated fats tend to increase. Um, and that same pattern is true in human heart disease as it is in human obesity, as it is in animals approaching torpor, um, you, see hot, you see rising MUFA in the face of, of uh, saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat dropping. And by the way, if you just give a mouse or a human um, the drug phenofibrate, which activates PPAR alpha, you see the exact same pattern. Saturated fat drops, polyunsaturated fat drops, monounsaturated fat goes what happens if you give a human canola oil, Brad? So canola oil is uh, is kind of like, to me, canola oil is like the most terrifying fat that one can eat. Um, so what's happening when you eat canola oil is you have a lot of, so canola oil is mostly oleic acid. So that, of course, is going to trigger PPA or alpha via OEA, as we've talked about. But it also has a substantial amount of uh, alpha linolenic acid, like in flaxseed oil. And that fat is the, the first one that the body wants to get rid of. It seems like out of all the fats, the body does not want to keep ALA around. And so, so that one gets sent into, the, into the, um, the mitochondria very quickly, and the mitochondria starts breaking that down. At the same time, you're activating uh, PPR alpha with all that monounsaturated fat, the oleic acid. And furthermore, 
Canola oil also has like 20% linoleic acid. And when PVR alpha is activated, that linoleic acid starts getting turned into arachidonic acid. And then all of these other enzymes are kicking in and converting that arachidonic acid to the oxylipins or the oxidized lipids. And so um, you can see all of these things increasing if you give someone canola oil. Um, you, you see this heightened conversion of of uh, linoleic acid, polyunsaturated fat to oxidized lipids, oxylipins. And so, and those are the signaling molecules that come out of the omega-6 fats that cause real problems. Um, specifically, there's ones called 15 heat and 20 heat, and they're strongly associated with obesity, with heart disease, and with uh, progression to diabetes. And so those are, you know, it, to me, it looks, they're just so implicated in the progression of those diseases that for me, it's, it, and we have studies, we know that people with high D6D activity, and again, that Delta 60 saturase is the limiting step in the conversion of linoleic acid, omega-6 fat to the oxidized downstream products of linoleic acid. Um, and we know that people who genetically have higher rates of D6D activity are much more likely to get diabetes and to get heart disease. And so there's just a ton of evidence that this conversion of linoleic acid to these oxylipins is implicated in the development of all these uh, diseases. And the thing that controls that D6D activity is... PPAR alpha and the thing that activates PPAR alpha is uh, the olive oil and the alpha linolenic acid. And so canola oil is the perfect combination of all of those things to just really crank up metabolic dysfunction. Um, I talk in my in in uh, one of my videos about a human controlled trial, and they fed people olive oil, and they were initially on a on a a, a basically a butter based diet, or it was like some combination of butter and, and, uh, linoleic acid. And then they put them either onto a sunflower oil based diet or onto a canola oil based diet. And all of the markers of de novo lipogenesis were highest in the canola group. And so, so the butter group was the best. Um, when you look at DNA and, and the authors of the paper don't talk about de novo lipogenesis markers, but I, but they gave us enough data that you can see them there. And so I looked at it and you can very plainly see that, you know, the people on the butter did the best. Uh, the people on the sunflower oil diet clearly have increased DNL, but the people on the canola oil diet had significantly more uh, increases in de novo lipogenesis than did even the people on the sunflower oil diet. So this is really important to highlight that people understand this, that when something triggers, and this sounds complicated, guys, but when something triggers this enzyme called PPAR alpha, peroxisome proliferator alpha, it pushes linoleic acid, the 18 carbon polyunsaturated fat found in seed oils, down a synthesis pathway that ends up in all of these ox lambs. So what activates PPAR alpha? We've talked about oleic acid, oxidized linoleic acid, alpha linolenic acid, and other things do as well. But those are, those are big ones. Not regular linoleic acid doesn't do it, but oleic acid does. So if you end up with a seed oil like canola oil that has a lot of oleic acid plus linoleic acid plus ALA, alpha linolenic acid, an omega-3 plus an omega-6 plus a monounsaturated fat, you basically push a lot of things down this pathway. Linoleic acid becomes arachidonic acid through GLA, DGLA, and then it becomes the heats and the hodes and all of these ox lambs that I've talked about in the past with people like Tucker Goodrich. And these are strongly associated with many, many bad diseases in humans heart disease, diabetes, obesity, 5 and 11 heat associated with obesity in humans. And so anything that pushes linoleic acid down the pathway into those ox lambs is giving your body signals. It's all information and signals. And canola oil is horrible at that. And then as we talked about this study, 
that Brad is mentioning with the canola oil is crazy because you can see all of these de novo lipogenesis markers going on. Brad, as we wrap up, let's talk about the Inuit because this is really interesting to me. This is another evolutionary story that you talk about on your, on your YouTube channel. You have a video there called like the redox apocalypse of the Inuit. And it, it's kind of an interesting story of what happens when humans end up in a place where there's not a lot of saturated fat. Yeah. And so, uh, so there's this, there's this mystery that has been talked about a lot, um, in the Inuit. And so they very rapidly, when they, you know, colonized the, the, the very far North, um, they lost this, they lost the functional copy of this gene called CPT1. And CPT1 is the gene that allows you to burn long chain fats in your mitochondria. So if you don't have CPT1, you can't, you, you can't send a uh, stearic acid, you can't send oleic acid, you can't send linoleic acid into your mitochondria for fuel. And also you can't really do uh, ketosis. And so a lot of people in the community said, you know, the fact that these Eskimos um, or Inuit, I should say, uh, lost this gene is that uh, perhaps long-term ketosis is, is bad for you. And so they lost this functionality that was allowing them to do ketosis. Um, now, I'm not personally a fan of, of doing long-term ketosis. However, I don't think that that idea is correct. What, when I look at this, and, and this was part of, you know, uh, PPA or alpha like oleic acid gets a lot of sort of positive press. Um, you know, if you read the scientific literature, people say all kinds of great things about activating PPA or alpha. But when I look at it, I see, I see these problems. I say, well, it's, it's increasing D6D and it's causing all these bad, and it's like hitting all these detoxification pathways. I'm not sure it's a good idea. And so I was thinking about this Inuit thing in the context of that. And so, um, and so they're eating this diet that is tremendously high in these polyunsaturated fats. And I'm arguing that these polyunsaturated fats are kind of weird and we should try to get rid of them. And so they did a study in mice and they took uh, mice that didn't have uh, PPA or alpha, right? And so, so it's not recognizing these, um, it's not recognizing different fats and it's not uh, turning on all these detoxification pathways. And if you take those mice and if you feed them fish oil, they die in about 10 days due to acute liver failure. So if you don't get rid of these polyunsaturated fats, these marine oils, um, presumably you will die of acute liver failure. And so, and so these, you know, and so these mice show us that, um, the job of this PPR alpha is in literature. Sometimes they call it the master controller of lipid metabolism, but that doesn't make sense because if you delete PPR alpha from a mouse, they burn the same amount of fat as a normal mouse. And so you're like, well, that doesn't seem right. Um, and so, I look at it and I say, I think this is a detoxification pathway. And I think that, you know, the, the lack of the CPT1 and the Inuit is because it's better to send these long uh, chain weird fats into your peroxisomes um, because the mitochondria is um, it, from a redox perspective and from the, the potential for oxidative damage is probably higher in the mitochondria, uh, peroxisomes have this enzyme called catalase, which is, uh, it's almost a magical enzyme, but it, but it really helps, um, keep like very fragile fats, like marine oils are probably better off, uh, oxidized, broken down in the peroxisomes. And so when I look at those Inuits, I think, um, the reason they've lost this, this gene is because they're eating, you know, they're eating marine oils that are well outside of the range of any other human diet on the planet. And they had to make this genetic switch. And I think it's because um, normal humans don't have the ability to really surge and activate our peroxisomes, which is what rodents do, who eat a lot of seeds and eat a lot of polyunsaturated fats, right? They have this high peroxisomal activity. Humans don't have that. And so to me, it looks like they lost that CPT1 gene and because of that, all of those marine fats are getting sent to peroxisomes to break down. And I think that's just a safer strategy if you're eating that amount of, of polyunsaturated fats and fragile fats in these, uh, 
these these marine omega-3 oils that can cause acute liver failure. And you make an interesting case for this by pointing out that the, the neighboring people, the Diné, right? The people from like the northern British Columbia also don't have they 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 eat very they eat much lower amounts of polyunsaturated fats, but their diet is mostly meat and fat. So they don't have a lot of carbohydrates either. Right. They're eating ruminants and they're presumably in longer term ketosis and they kept their CPT1 gene. And so if if the issue was yeah, this idea that long-term ketosis was bad, you would expect to see much wider spread this loss of the CPT1. It seems it seems like it's in the places where they're eating the marine fats. Yeah. They're eating excess amounts or large amounts of polyunsaturated fats from whale blubber and seal blubber and whale blubber. Like this. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's just moving from the equator. Yeah. And I'm also not a fan of long-term ketosis for reasons I've spoken about in the past. I think that for some people, maybe there are genetic genetics that allow long-term ketosis to be better. But I think that my, my short take on long-term ketosis is that the, the ketogenic community doesn't do enough justice to the fact that a lot of people in long-term ketosis end up with really significant electrolyte insufficiency, uh, massively impaired thyroid function, which you can see in the free T3 and the free T4, and lower body temperatures, suggesting lower metabolism and probably some indication of torpor if we believe that's going on. So if people are thriving on a ketogenic diet, great. Um, my pushback against the ketogenic diet has only been to point out that a lot of people I think aren't thriving on a ketogenic diet and the ketogenic community maybe isn't as forthcoming about potential negative downsides there. So Brad, I think that like, what's the takeaway for people here? You know, I think that this is a really interesting concept and the whole reason I do this podcast is for people to have information that they can use to make health decisions and kind of have health sovereignty. I have a good friend and, and he's, he eats a mostly carnivorous diet, maybe some vegetables occasionally, but he eats a lot of olive oil. And so when I started thinking about the things you were talking about, I said to him, Hey, maybe you should stop eating so much olive oil. You're, you're just, maybe you're just giving your body a signal for obesity. And I, I think that a lot of people in ketogenic communities are potentially eating a lot of olive oil and potentially eating a lot of monounsaturated fat. So I think like, what's, what's your perspective on this? What's the takeaway from all these things we've been talking about? Yeah. It, it, yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's correct. I, I think that, you know, keeping in mind the, the kind of, that kind of ratio of stearic acid to oleic acid, I think is really important. And, you know, um, when you think so what fats are high in 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 that ratio well we've already mentioned there's beef suet i think that's a good choice um there's of course dairy fats are are very low in monounsaturated fats and you know oh by the way that's the those are the classical fats eaten in places like france and the early us where people were lean right those diets are very high in butter and they're they're very high in um it's it's a it's a fat and starch based diet and people stay lean on it and it's based on dairy fat. And so, uh, here's a fun anecdote. Um, in Julia Child's book, mastering the art of French cooking, her first recipe about, uh, how to roast a chicken. The, the recipe literally says, roast the chicken, uh, remove all of the, all of the drippings, all of the fat, you know, chickens are very high in monounsaturated fat. She says, remove all of those drippings from the pan. And then, she replaces it with a, a butter-based sauce that goes on the chicken. So Julia Childs in Mastering the Art of French Cooking literally says, essentially, remove the chicken fat and replace it with butter, right? Um, and so I, I, think that's, I think that's super important to keep in mind. Um, and just real quick back on the branched-chain amino acid thing, um, Again, I don't think branched chain amino acids are bad. If you can break them down and if you're doing that and if you're insulin sensitive, I think that's great. Um, you know, I, I swat, like I say, I reduced my BCAAs and I increased my glycine and my connective tissues. And so I'm eating things like uh, pork rinds. Um, I'm doing these microwave pork rinds or, um, you know, there's other brands where they're not fried in, in bad oils. That's a great source of, of, collagen and connective tissue, but I'm also using bone broths. I also make uh, pig's feed and I'm doing beef tendon, which you can get at the Asian store. It's actually really good. I kind of simmer that. And that's another great source of collagen. Um, you know, and in my case, that 
when I did that, when I made that switch, my, so I'd have this, this long-term problem with high fasting blood glucose. It was like 115 to 120 most mornings was my fasting blood glucose. And within making that switch of changing the types of proteins, it went, my blood glucose went down to normal within a week. Uh, you know, I was starting to get readings around 90 and now, um, I'm getting readings more like 80, which is like considered really perfect. You know, that's really considered perfect blood glucose. If you wake up in the morning, your fat, some blood glucose is 80. Um, that's ideal. And, you know, I got that just, just making that switch and the proteins. And so I think one of the takeaways is, you know, maybe this isn't so much for the, the individual user, but, but for the scientific community is, you know, we should be approaching these problems more with an idea of like an evolutionary biologist, right? Like that, that's why I talk about torpor and why I think about nematodes and, and sponges is that, um, you know, you have to kind of put these, these different systems into historical perspective. And then, and then what happens is when you think about all these problems, they're less like a series of different random problems and it's more all part of a process, right? Because when I started thinking about the branch chain amino acids, I realized, I see, this is also controlled by PPAR alpha because PPAR alpha is trying to put you into that torpid metabolism. And part of the torpid metabolism, if you're going to hibernate, uh, animals really hold on to their, uh, to their muscle tissue and their lean mass, and they're not wanting to break down amino acids. And, and again, that's, that's contributing to the, that's contributing to that insulin resistance, uh, to that torpid metabolism. And so by making that switch, you know, I lost 15 pounds in the month of October. Um, I've had some unfortunate life things since then. So I haven't been able to stick as closely to that, but I'm, I'm super excited about January, February, March, because I, I just feel so much more in control now, right? Knowing this fact and that that was the thing that all along has been, um, you know, it's been, it's been this, this huge, uh, area that I, that I hadn't thought that much about. And so when I was trying all these different diets and these different things, and a lot of them worked, you know, like a, a little bit, they worked here and they worked there, but, uh, that for me seems like it might be the final piece of the puzzle. And so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about, uh, continuing to lose weight going forward. Um, also, by the way, if people want to follow along with this, we have a great discussion board over on Reddit at r slash saturated fat. There's a bunch of really uh, smart people over there. And actually, I mentioned the um, kind of branch chain amino acid restriction thing in, in a video um, on my YouTube. And people at r saturated fat started do, doing this before I did, right? They saw it in the video and they were like, well, this is interesting. Let's try it. And they were reporting back to me really good results. And that's when I was like, okay, well, maybe I should try this thing. <laughs> and, uh, but, but again, it's all, you know, it's part of that idea of, of, um, of what do, what, you know, if obesity really is uh, essentially a, a human form of torpor, then, then that, uh, then if you start to think about things that way and like, what do bears do? What do hibernating animals do? Well, they're burning fat. Um, and they're not burning much protein, right? Uh, some of them have a stash of, you know, uh, chipmunks have an underground stash of uh, like tubers and things like uh, chestnuts, right? Which are high in starch, but they're low in protein, interestingly. So you see a lot of hibernating animals are burning their own stored body fat and, and starches, right? And so I thought, well, if I'm really in torpor, maybe doing a diet that's starch based low in protein and high in connective tissues is the thing that might push me out of that right and and so far so good um and and i guess that's just like what i like to uh tell people from a very big picture is that we should be thinking about these different problems like heart disease and diabetes as more part of a biological process rather than like um, you know, individual diseases or kind of disconnected diseases, you know, humans like to kind of like specialize and focus very tightly right on, on these things. And, um, so that's my, that's my very, that's my very high level kind of nerdy, uh, take home. But, um, 
yeah, we're going to, we're going to keep trying. Uh, there's going to be, I've got the emergence uh, that will be a thing someday. It's not quite there yet, but, uh, uh, people can look forward to that and, uh, yeah, get it, get on the Reddit thread, r slash saturated fat. Um, I'm fire underscore bottle on Twitter. Uh, you can follow along there or just go to fire and there'll be lots of updates coming. That's great. Yeah. I think your YouTube channel is one of the most underrated channels out there for people. There's a lot of really interesting videos there. I kind of appreciate the, like the low budget, the little animations and like the little drawings you do. It's pretty awesome. It's like very, it's very, like it's very underproduced, which I appreciate, but the information is really compelling. So I think people should check out your fire in a bottle YouTube channel as well. But yeah, I mean, my perspective when I think about all this stuff is not to, I don't want to make this harder for people. I want to make it easier for people. And as I've tried to say more and more in my social media outlets, look, if you're thriving, don't change anything. If you're eating olive oil and you're crushing life and you're lean and you're where you want to be, then maybe it's not affecting you negatively. But if there are people who are eating a lot of olive oil and can't lose some weight or are not where they want to be in terms of insulin sensitivity, and obviously seed oils are not a good thing. And I've spoken about that ad nauseum at this point. But I think that there, this, this idea of the connections between environmental signals and hibernation slash torpor torpor in humans is really interesting because it makes so much sense. This is where we've come from as humans. This is our evolutionary history. This is our lineage is, you know, we are mammals. We don't hibernate, but we certainly can pack on weight and become insulin resistant if we eat the wrong foods. And unfortunately, a lot of processed foods are full of things that give our body the signal that it's time to have winter. And so if you're eating a lot of seed oils, if you're eating a lot of oils that are high in alpha linoleic acid, if you're eating a lot of linoleic acid in seed oils, you're just giving your body a winter signal. And that's, that's probably why processed foods are so harmful for humans. Just one reason. We talked a little bit about hyperphagia and AEA and the enzyme that breaks that down. It all kind of makes sense. You know, you're going to overeat, your thyroid hormones are going to go down, your metabolism is going down, you're going to look like you're doing DNL and, and you're going to change your metabolism at the level of fats. And so the, the takeaway for me is just look, give your body the signal that there's abundance all the time. And for me, that really looks like an animal-based diet. It looks like meat. Um, but I think, you know, there's some, there's some validity to not overdoing the muscle meat, as we talked about. Make sure you're balancing the muscle meat with glycine and collagen. It looks like animal fats. It looks like stearic acid in tallow or suet, fire starter from hardened soil or in butter. I eat a lot of dairy fats. I mean, don't overdo it on the olive oil or consider doing an experiment where you get rid of the olive oil. Imagine that. I don't eat any olive oil. I've never been a fan for a variety of other reasons. Olive oil had the highest amount of phthalates, hmm. which are these endocrine disrupting fragrance type chemicals that can get into the human body. And they're cleared more quickly than PFAs, perfluoroalkyl substances. But olive oil had the highest amount of PFAs. Olive oils also help seed oils. Anyway, I just don't think olive oil is as healthy as people believe it is. And I wanted to talk about this. Thanks for your work on this, Brad. Um, I'll see you next time, man. Yeah, that was great. Thanks for having me on.